show is brought to you by Composer. To learn more about Composer, visit composer.trade. You've probably heard us talk about this before. The way that I describe Composer is if you, if you ever did any back testing, right? And you want to like bring it to life with a strategy. You could do that at Composer. You could build your own, what they call symphonies. So you could build rules, rules based. And in today's environment where things are more muddy than ever, it is important to have rules. So you're not just hopping from one foot to the next, like I do every podcast. So today I want to talk just for a second about one of their symphonies, because they have their own strategies. You know, you can build your own if you want, but they've got something called crude reality, what they call the smarter oil playbook. So Duncan, did you know that if you wanted to buy like spot oil, like if you want to actually track the price of crude oil, you can't do it. I did not know. What you can do, you could buy ETFs, but there's all sorts of shenanigans that goes on with the roll yield and, and the future. So you're not actually getting exposure to the price. So here's how this symphony works. If oil, if crude oil is actually going up, and I'm talking about an ETF, if it's actually going up, then you could have the entire portfolio in crude oil, the, the, the ETF that represents crude oil. If it's not, you can hedge it. You can go into other things. So there are all sorts of symphonies for all sorts of investor risk tolerances. I suggest if you are interested in learning more about these different symphonies and how Composer can implement them for you, you go to composer.trade to learn more. Episode 76. Big show, new friend on the show today. You have never been here before. Am I, I have right? never been here and I am nerding out right okay. now. This is so cool. Uh, we are so excited to have you. We've been looking forward to this episode for a long time. You're here on the perfect day. I CPI mean, day. CPI yep. day. Uh, let's give everybody the official introduction. We wrote this for you. I hope you like it. Shall I read it to you? Stare into Josh's read eyes as he reads this. Well, no, I have to Make read it, it very the, awkward. I have to read it off the screen. <laughs> Callie, you are an investment analyst for eToro, a multi-asset social investment platform with 20 million plus users. Give that a round of applause. That's a lot of users. Woo! All right. Uh, prior to eToro, Callie was a senior investment strategist at Ally and a senior research analyst at LPL Financial. Welcome to the show, Callie Cox. What's up? So good to be here. What? Wait, let's go. Let's start from the the. Let's start from Ally. Is that G, that? Is that the old GE Capital or is that the old G, uh, General Motors? GM. Yeah. GM. That's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So. What what was that like to what was that like to be the senior investment strategist at essentially the old credit corp that GM used to own? What was that gig like? Well, you know, I joined there in 2020, so I wasn't there in like the old GM to yeah, Ally yeah, yeah. days. So it was much much further along than that. But um, let me tell you, like working with retail investors, that was the first job I had working at a brokerage that you know, catered to mainly retail investors. Is that what that it, was? It was a broker dealer? Yeah, it's a broker dealer. It still is. Ally Invest. So are you slinging stocks at, at people? No, 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 okay. no, no. I'm doing what I do. It's essentially what I do at eToro is a content focused job. I am a strategist. Um, I run our models. You know, I look at portfolios and think about portfolio strategy, but I think of a way to communicate it to the retail investor, the individual investor who's saying like, okay, well, I'm seeing this on CNBC. What matters for me? And that's basically what I did at Ally, too. I, I helped build out their, we call it the point of view strategy, which is a content strategy around developing these market insights and then just thinking of really innovative, engaging ways to bring them to customers and infusing them throughout the business. 20 million users is really big. It's, it's pretty big. We're pretty how big in e Europe. So how did eToro get to 20 million users? Tell us, tell us what we don't know about the eToro story. So fun fact, eToro is 15 years old. They started in 2007. I had to do the math in my head really quick. 2007, Yoni and Ronan started it Israel. back in, yeah, Tel Aviv. Yeah. Yep. And they just, they just started growing. And, you know, we really, we really caught fire back in Europe, um, especially in the past few years. Um, and I, I couldn't tell you how. Why was it so popular in Europe? A lot of cream sauces in your portfolios or what? <laughs> Cigarettes, what do they like about? A lot of baked beans. Um, I, I really think it was just our focus on that particular market and the fact that we offer just so many products. And okay. that's eToro's big thing. It's like, we're, we're just going to give you every single product you want. 
Um, we're not quite there in the U.S. yet. Um, the U.S. is a little, I mean, we're a little bit younger, so we're slowly building out um, our broker-dealer business over here. But, you know, in Europe, um, Yoni is super, super passionate about putting everything on the platform, NFTs, crypto, CFDs, stocks, bonds, options, commodities, currencies, everything. And Wait, what's a CFT? CFD? Yeah. It's a Certificate of Financial Trauma. <laughs> I, I mean, know. honestly, you're not it's too far off. What that, is it? It's customer, uh, Alicia. What I can't remember what it stands for, but it's essentially it's essentially I want, like I want I want like yeah, three. Can, can, I, I, want can three. I have a million yeah. dollars worth? No, I'm I'm, I'm don't bullish. Google it. You don't have to Google. We don't I'm bullish. It's not 60 minutes. You don't have to have the answer. It's it's a, okay. it's it's, uh, it's kind of like an off exchange way to speculate or hedge. Oh, Michael loves it. It's not available exchange. in the U.S. No, Would you say it's <laughs> over the counter? Uh, so, OTC. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. So Etor. All right. So, but now the European online brokerage market probably wasn't as saturated as the U.S. one. So that was probably a very smart thing to pursue, like growth there, because here we have like a million broker dealers. So, right. so what sets you guys apart from all of the other ways that people can trade here, up to and including, let's say, Robinhood? Well, we are a social investing app. We were the original social investing app because okay. we've been around for 15 years. Um, you know, we we just offer so much and we uh, are very, very focused on, you know, tapping the retail investor and giving them exactly what they need, which I know is kind of like a selling line for most retail brokerages. Yeah, um, but, but you we, actually do it. <laughs> but pretend. we actually do it. Come yeah. on. Uh, well, we are, I, I believe we're the only brokerage that offers stocks, crypto and options right now. Um, really? All on one platform. I might, I might have to check check on that. But Robinhood does, no? Whatever. Who cares? Let's, who cares? <laughs> who cares? You do it. You yeah. do it better. All right. Well, we're so we're so happy to have you. Thank you for coming. So let's start with CPI. I thought this was a nothing burger. The market, like initially, like the knee jerk was down and then ripped higher. Um, there wasn't really anything in here that was different than anyone's expectations. But maybe you could tell me I'm wrong. Yeah, so I think I think overall you're right. I looked, so I was on my Bloomberg, you know, watching it per usual. Not around. to brag. And I know, I know, I have a Bloomberg terminal. Um, <laughs> I love yeah, she's the, she's the best. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so around eight thirty, I was like looking on my Bloomberg terminal, you know, watching everything come out, and it was bang on for like the consensus type stuff, which is rare, right? I, like everything was in line. Uh, pretty much, pretty much. It was pretty. Uh, well. We give people the numbers. Um, CPI was down 0.1% month over month in December. Which was expected, by the way. Expected. And in November, it was up plus 0.1 mm -hmm. month over month. Uh, annual inflation, 6.5%. Slowest pace since October 2021. That number, which is the big number everyone focuses on, which we could talk about, is now down six straight months, mm -hmm. which is great. The energy index— But wait, but wait, but wait. If you annualize, like, the last three months, we're, like, there. We're, like, at their target. Yeah, and it's because goods goods inflation is falling like a stone right now. Yes. Uh, the energy component was down 4.5% in December, so that mm -hmm. helps. Goods fell 0.3%. The thing, the sticking point is that food costs are still high, and then obviously anything to do with rent, but we know that's like a six-month out-of-date thing. Mm -hmm. um, I'll just throw this out. According to the CPI print, shelter was up 0.8% in December, but the apartment list national rent index, which is like, probably better, fell 0.8% in December month over month, which is the fourth straight decline. Rents declined in 90 out of 100 of the largest U.S. cities. Mm -hmm. The sharpest decline in NYC, uh, minus 3% in December alone. That's a big drop. So these things are going in the right direction. I guess it took the market like five minutes to process that. And then we were green on the screen the rest of the day. Yeah, but here's where I struggle. I feel like when I see economic data these days, I almost have to look at it as an analyst and then dissociate a little bit and think about how Jay Powell is seeing it and how the Fed is seeing it. Because we've seen these trends. We've seen real-time data show that rents are rolling off. And, you know, a lot of real-time data is showing that inflation is slowing very, very quickly. And that's what's making everybody angsty right now. They're like, hello, we're seeing it. Right. We're seeing it happen. But at the Fed's December meeting, Jay Powell was like, oh, we have a high burden of proof. You know, we need to see more evidence. And nothing has really changed from that trend perspective, which makes me nervous, which makes me think that the Fed wants to see something pop up in CPI or PCE. When you say pop up, what do you mean? Uh, so I'll it back up a, a Like a downside shock? Uh, so I'm looking at services inflation. I'm looking at services inflation, X energy. Um, I'm looking at, you know, the rent component of CPI, services X rent. Um, that still hasn't peaked. Uh, in the CPI data. It's just climbing more slowly. 
Yes, okay. it is climbing more slowly. We're, we're getting there, but it still hasn't peaked. And I think where the market is thrown right now, and honestly where a lot of people are thrown is – we're seeing rents roll over again in real-time data. We're seeing real-time data confirm the fact that, you know, the Fed is actually pulling this off. But the Fed is like, no, 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 we need that high, high burden of proof. And you're like, well, how much more can I show they you? They need a million layoffs. Other than the official. Uh, well, I think that's I mean, right. That's, that's, that's the way to Because wages rolled over dramatically. Yeah. So what else? It's, is it, is it it's just it's it's I'm with you. It's employment. What else? Yeah. Headline unemployment is 3.5%. Yeah. How the hell can you declare victory on inflation? If if the only people who've gotten fired are like a handful what, of white collar workers at Amazon, what if they're well, thinking that that we need demand destruction, we need a recession because if we don't, if we pull off the soft landing it'll too be too fast, people will start spending like crazy again. Well, I they're dead set on getting inflation down, and that in a vacuum makes sense because you need to nip inflation in the bud. You can't have persistently they did. high inflation. Yeah, 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 I agree with you, but I think they're just being like. Super, super, super sure, which I'm not sure is the right approach. If we get a recession in the second half of this year because they do 25 in February, they do 25 in March, we blow through the month of April, there's no FOMC. May, they they don't make any noises about pausing or they do another hike. And then the a whole accumulation of everything that they did in 2022. And then in the second half, we're in a recession. What's the narrative? The Fed retook its credibility. Don't mess with the Fed. When they tell you they're going to do something, they do it. Or, hey, these idiots missed it in both directions. Uh, they let inflation yeah. run hot for a year. We had the worst inflation in 40 years. And then they crushed the economy after to add insult. Well, what injury. if those are the two narratives and you've got just two camps? Well, I'm asking. Yeah. What, what, do you th- what, do you think would, what do you think would be like the – what would be the vibes <laughs> What would be the that? vibes? Uh, I think it's the second one, but maybe I'm wrong. I, I think it would be the second one too. What's and- the second one? That they're idiots? Look at these yeah, idiots. That, like, they, they missed it. And they, then they didn't tighten. And then they over tightened. And then a they year took after, the they, they the should have. Yeah. And, yeah. and then they got it wrong on the way out and they crushed the economy all over again. And now we have to mm-hmm. go back to 0% interest rates yeah. because there's a financial crisis. Yeah, like, knowing how the world thinks right now. And that, that sounds like a really, that's a bad way to put it. But, you know, knowing the vibes right now, the vibes around the, the mistrust of the government and the fact that crypto exists, yeah. decentralization and stuff. Yes, I think that would be. The I way. think that's like, cons- honestly, Maybe like because I'm getting a lot of stuff that's being filtered through social media or whatever. I honestly think consensus is that they blow it and that they've already blown it. It's too late. Like I think that that's the expectation well, is that I, I they're going to get ro- get it wrong in both directions. I think directions. There's, there's – there's, there's, it's starting to shift to maybe they're going to pull this off. Mm-hmm. Like there's definitely – it's definitely – stock, In stock prices, I agree. It seems and, the, like, and the economy. And the economy. Like listen – I agree with you. Uh, mm-hmm. Everything that we're seeing looks – and smells like a soft landing. Mm-hmm. It's not over yet, obviously. If you but- get wage growth to fall, but keep unemployment under four percent. That's the, that's the definition of a soft landing. Yeah, and there and are infl- ways with you inflation can do coming that down too. With yeah. inflation and coming with down. inflation trending down. So yeah. one of the things that's different about today versus wait, can I just? Yeah. I want to throw one thing into that mix though. It's where the puck is going, and where the puck is going is that even if they're done hiking rates, they're not done with QT, mm-hmm. and that is every bit as aggressive in terms of tightening real financial conditions as rate hikes are. That's one. Two, there's a lot of debt, like in the trillions, that has to be rolled. It'll be rolled at higher prices. And that is also another version of tightening just by a different name. So even if they stop with the Fed funds rate, we are like definitely not done with tightening. So Mm -hmm. it's very premature to start being like, hey, they just might pull this off. I feel like there's way more tightening to come regardless of the next FOMC. So two things there. I'm in the camp where I think they can pull it off. I'm a little more optimistic than the average Good. Wall Street economist. More than me. And Good. I'm not an economist. Uh, you know, maybe it's just because I'm cup half full. But um, I, it looks like they're pulling it off so far. And there is just so much strength there. The job market will not budge, which is a great thing. That's what we want. So, you know, until I see proof that a recession really is coming in the leading indicators, then, and, and you're, see, you're seeing a little bit, a little bit of weakness. The ISM services number made me a little nervous. And le- leading economic indicators are rolling over, like yeah. to be clear. They don't Oh, look yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. we're, li- I mean, we're talking about the more rate sensitive ones, right? Like housing has been in the toilet for a while now. You know, I'm thinking especially about initial jobless claims. I mean, those have stuck to historical lows for so long. And- I mean, I'm thinking a lot about the job market too, a lot of what we're seeing in the job market. And it's just, it's really, really hard 
to think a recession is around the corner if the job market is so strong. Um, but I will say one thing about QT2. Yes, the Fed is slowing rate hikes, and yes, they might be done, but that doesn't mean they cut. I think so many people are overlooking the fact that the Fed is more than happy to pause rates and to see. I hope they pause and to ke- and to ke- and to ke- and to keep tight and to keep uh, tightening via balance sheet. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's continuing, and I hope the reason why I hope they pause is just from the perspective of an investor in fixed income. Yeah, like it just makes our jobs as planners a lot easier. Wait, why is that? If we if we can fulfill somebody's financial plan with four percent bond yields, mm. like that's fantastic. It's been fifty ba- seventy basis points yeah. for the last decade, well, maybe a little bit more than that. But yeah, one of the things that we're trying to do as financial planners, there's no like there's no way to know what asset classes will do, but there is some certainty in being able to quote the starting rate of a treasury bond and its duration, and giving people some sense of yeah, you can pretty much expect to get that. As your annual rate of return well, so from 60, that bond, sixty forty became seventy thirty. Right. So if sixty forty can be sixty forty again, mm-hmm. it's like a it's a wonderful thing. You can give people a little bit more a little bit more certainty on a larger part of the portfolio. Yeah, and you don't have to step out so far in risk exactly. to get that return. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Um, I we haven't spoken about housing, but I think that if rates stay here and they go back a little bit lower, like housing activity is going to skyrocket. I think that prices will probably come down, but I think that buyers are going to return and sellers. What's like, the magic the, number on a thirty-year mortgage? Is it sub six percent? It's, it's, it's already down one hundred twenty basis points from the high. Where I'm sorry, it? Michael Antonelli, one point two percent. Where is it? it it's six one six two. So I'm saying yeah. is under six. Is that the magic number where people call the mortgage broker? Yeah, I don't down? know where the line in the sand is, but for people that have been frozen out, like they're going to come back really quickly. Um, so I'm going to give you some anecdata, data and I don't love anecdata, data, but I am a millennial and I do have friends. Neither do I, but if it houses. supports what I'm thinking, then I love it. So let's hear <laughs> it. Yeah, we'll be all for it. It might, yeah. it might. We'll be all for it. I mean, I, I still have a lot of friends in Charlotte looking for houses. Um, it, the search sucks right mm-hmm. now, but the main thinking, and I'm talking like probably five to 10 friends. The main thinking though is like, by God, we need a house. We are going to find that house and we'll just refi. Is Charlotte representative, though, of what's going on in most American metropolitan areas? Why not? Probably not. Why I think not? You're, I think you're in better shape than most. Uh, yeah, I think so, too. I mean, Charlotte's we've experienced like high, it's high, like a boom town. Yeah, it's a high income city. Yeah. But, you know, anecdata. Yeah. Anecdata. Hey, you're from, so I forgot you're from Charlotte. Do you know Paul? Paul. No. <laughs> okay. Uh, we have a funny last name. We have Charlotte's an advisor who works for us in Charlotte. Do you know oh, Paul? we should meet. Do you know Paul? Hundred percent. Do you know Carolyn? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, you have a CPI chart. Can we get to this? Well, so this is what I wanted to discuss. Right. Um, pop this. Pop this on. On. The- oh wait, hang on. Just, just the last part of the housing thing. So if because they're going to break something, they're going to break something, which was not unreasonable. That thing that they were going to break was the housing market, and it slowed dramatically. Mm-hmm. Right, housing starts down forty percent. They they did it, but if it can get turned back on. And they don't break the housing market. Like that's another feather in the cap for the soft landing crowd. I so, think I so, but you have to balance. I don't know out. if that's good though. That's yeah. the thing that they don't want a reacceleration in home I prices. I get it. I understand. No, but I'm. I don't think you get that. I think you get okay. activity at lower prices. Is there a such thing? Why not? Can Can we get like a burst of activity that doesn't drive prices up? Absolutely. Uh, when? From where? Uh, there's no. There's nothing in the data. The last. This whole experience was so – there's no analog for Do so you it. feel like real estate is either hot or cold? If real estate gets hot again and houses are turning over, prices are going up not I, long after. I, I think that there – I think that you can see an acceleration of activity without – you're not going to see new all-time home prices, all, new all-time highs in home prices, unless rates come dramatically though, which is probably not happening. Yeah, so you think we can land somewhere in the middle, yeah, right? Yeah, I think houses will adjust. Lukewarm, Goldilocks. So here, here's the thing. Houses, house prices went up so much. That for them to get back to the average of 2019, that would be a 30 plus percent crash, which had, has never happened before. Duncan, mm-hmm. is this the most optimistic show we've done in like a few months? I'm feeling good. I'm would placing trades. How much, <laughs> how, how much of this optimism you think is coming from like stock prices have been going higher? Like yeah. Mike sounds pretty bold. No, wait a minute. That's all wait a minute. It. When did we speak to Derek? Was that two weeks ago? Stocks weren't on fire when I, when I started getting optimistic. Yeah, no, it's been two weeks, right? So um, anyway. You might even be driving the rally then. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna it fight you. On, I, you. I won't fight you on that. Okay. The rally is coming from inside the the podcast. Yes. Uh, all right. Um, so, Callie, you did this thing on. So, right now, the S and P 500. It's Thursday afternoon, and it's nothing with nothing. Uh, up 33, 0.33 percent. I'm sorry. Uh, there are pockets of strength, as there always are, but it's a it's a relatively relatively quiet day on Wall Street. Prior to this, 
there has been uh, a lot of volatility on CPI, CPI day. So Callie, what had we seen prior to today? So I feel a little silly pulling this chart up now since everything is quiet, but there, there's still 45 minutes left so in the trading over day. It's, it's not over. over. Yeah. Um, so the past four CPI reports, I mean, everybody saw this. The market was nuts around them. I remember in October, I actually had a doctor's appointment. So I was in the doctor's office when CPI came out. And I remember checking, you know, checking the market right after it and being like, bleep, shit, whatever. It was like, Oh my God, like look at the market, it dropped like 3%. The doctor's like, Callie, you have three months to live. And you're like, I know, but wait, (laughs) Wait, wait, CPI is out. I need to check them. I need to place some hedging trades. Um, Yeah, so I remember checking it like minutes after and we were down 3%. And then got out of the doctor's office, like 30 minutes later, we were up too. And we've seen those kinds of swings for the past three or four CPI reports. I think that this has something to say about positioning. I think that there's, there's just a lot of like data data-driven positioning going on. And the market is just so laser-focused on data and it matriculates through the rest of uh, rest of capital markets, including the options market, which but I've done a this, lot of research so Look on, at this but, chart that you did. Like September was a surprise to the downside. But then you get a reacceleration in October that freaks no, everyone no, no, wait, out. Wait, so it's Josh, this is, yeah, this is close-to-close changes, the ones that you're no, looking at. No, but these at. are on CPI days, though, is my point. Right. Yeah. So I'm saying we had we had we thought I think this summer you had a big rally that started started in, uh, the market bottoms in June, July we rallied hard. August is a pretty good month. Stock prices, mm-hmm. and we thought we kind of had seen the worst of the inflation. Yeah. And then that number came out in I guess I guess the October number was the one, and it just shocked us to the downside. And it was like, oh my god, this isn't over yet. Right. I th- so. Right. Could that not happen again? Like, oh yeah, it could I'd, totally happen again. I'm sure it could happen. It didn't again. happen today. I'd, Next CPI, who knows? Let yeah. me just defend my bullishness for a second. So everybody's <laughs> pessimistic. The stock market was down 20 percent last year, and the big thing, the whole, the whole thing was inflation. That was it, right? That was the whole deal. We are past peak inflation, um, and so I think there are reasons to be optimistic. I think the big risk which is obviously a risk, are earnings. I don't think the whole thing was inflation. It was. The, the, the whole- I think the big the whole, shock was, the was ru- uh, Come on. Ru- Russia invading Ukraine no, was no. a massive market story. It was inflation and interest rates, which was the same story. Uh, it's a Fed tightening It's because of inflation. China yeah. spent the whole year in rolling COVID lockdowns. Nobody that here was, cares. It was not about that. But it mattered for fundamentals. Doesn't matter. But I think that those are subtexts to inflation and interest rates. I agree. Kind of yeah. I agree. Inflation, like those CPI days that, that you're talking about, um, those were like the new, remember, remember when jobless, uh, claims day was the big day or yep. unemployment, like it was CPI day was NFP, it non-farm, was pay, NFP. non-farm yeah. payrolls used to be the Super Bowl every month. Yeah. CPI took its place. I totally agree. That and that so was I just story. think if earnings come in less bad than expected, even if they fall, just not as much as people were thinking, like, I think the risk can be to the upside. So that's, that's where we're coming from too. That's my view. Um, I think that. I think that we're being too pessimistic once again with fourth quarter earnings, yeah. especially with the dollar and, you know, the big fall that we've seen in the dollar. Has that been worked in? I'm not so sure. Yeah. So anyway, of course I could be wrong, like obviously, but I think there's oh, reason to be optimistic. Be. So uh, I want to talk about inflation expectations, which are a big driver of actual inflation. Mm-hmm. Those are rolling over dramatically. Why? Because it's it's a lot of this is just gasoline, right? Like that that is a big driver of how people view inflation. Yeah. Isn't that crazy psychologically though, thinking about how – You know, gas prices are the thing that's always in your face. Uh, You know, we can talk about egg prices. We can talk about groceries. But gas prices are like the main indicator for average America. I buy eggs every week. I have no idea how much eggs cost. You know why? I just, it's it's one of 40 items in my shopping cart. I have no idea. I think employers are feeling less anxiety about whether or not they'll be able to find uh, labor. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, It's not showing up in the form of headline unemployment, let's say. But all of the small business owners or NFIB or whatever, that's all cooling off. Like, I don't think people are panicked about finding workers right now in the way that we were, let's say, a year ago. Mm -hmm. And that is a big setter of inflation expectations. Like, if you're able to hire people or not feel like you can't fire anyone, that kind of anxiety feeds through into higher expectations that are just not materializing right now. Yeah. So that helps. That's a really good point. And the thing that we've been harping on this whole year, too, is that inflation expectations have basically hovered around 2%. 
this whole year. And that is the big difference between now and the 1970s. The market investors think the Fed can do this. And they haven't, well, I mean, time to time, you're going to hear people like complain about it. I do too. But you know, on the whole, cumulatively, investors haven't stepped off of this idea that the Fed can do it. The Fed almost, in a weird way, has retained its credibility there. Well, so let's talk about calling the Fed's bluff. Let's do it. So, Callie, what do we have to say about this topic? Okay, so, I mean, gosh, there's so much to say about this topic. So, everybody's talking about the bond vigilantes. Vigilantes? Vil- I don't know. <laughs> that sounds that very sophisticated. Vigilantes. 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 <laughs> it's only vigilante if it comes from the vigilante region of yeah, France, right? Exactly. That's uh, right. <laughs> Uh, okay, so the bond vigilantes, vigilantes, uh, two-year yield, obviously, pricing in, has been pricing in rate cuts for a bit. Uh, it peaked in November. Um, and, you know, the big question is, can the bond market force the Fed's hand? I to actually— cut, To cut rates. To cut rates. Wait, Kat, can you just explain for the listener that doesn't understand what's the difference between the two-year and the Fed funds and, and what, what, what's driving what? Is there a tail that's wagging the dog here type of thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the Fed funds rate is the policy rate rate that the Fed changes. It's the overnight lending rate for banks. Uh, Yes, banks uh, trade around money every once in a while. Um, All right, so that's the Fed funds rate. The two-year yield, we're getting into the Treasury market. This is debt backed by the U.S. government. Um, The two-year yield, seen as a proxy for the Fed funds rate, you know, ostensibly two years down the road. Um, But a lot of people look at at it as, what will the Fed do next? Um, and we've seen in a lot, uh, in many hiking cycles in the past, that the two-year yield has foreshadowed Fed rate cuts. Um, back so when in, the two-year rolls over, the Fed, the Fed is likely to cut next. Right, exactly. So when the two-year peaks and then you know falls from that peak, the Fed you know stop stops hiking or they tend to cut. What was the peak yield on the two-year in November? Was it four four point five? Something around four point five. Four point six. Yeah, I missed and that. I, Come back. Okay, and now, and now what is it? F- four and a quarter? Yeah, it's like around four and a quarter. Okay, but we don't know that that's the peak. We know it's a peak, but okay. Right, right. But like, that's just knows, pricing but... in like traders' expectations. And okay. Yeah, so, but if that is the peak. If that is, if that it's, is the it's, peak. It's 4-1. One. I mean, this— 4-1? This, this, this rolled over pretty— Okay. Pr- uh, uh. Uh. Does anybody else see head and shoulders? Anybody else see that? What's interesting is when we say roll over— that's the yield we're talking about. Mm-hmm. Price is up. Pe- uh, people are buying those bonds to make those yields fall. That's people looking at that and saying, wait a minute, let me get this straight. You're going to pay me two and a ha- uh, four and a half percent risk-free over the next two years? I'll take it. I'll take all you got. That's how you put in a top in, in that bond price. So like we're talking about rolling over in terms of the yield, but another way to think about it is, hey, people feel pretty good that – this is about as high as rates are going to get, or they're just happy with that level for whatever bucket of money they're using. Right, which insinuates down the road that rates, the two-year rate will not be higher, right, right if you're stepping in there. Yeah, said differently, bonds are ripping. So bonds are ripping. Yeah, yeah. 10 years under 3.5. What's this thing on Neil Kashkari on investors' expectations? I, I actually didn't cuts? read this yet. Did you read this article? Kashkari? Yeah. Which one? So Kashkari was speaking with Tim Morales. Let me quote oh, it. I don't Let me quote so. it. I've uh, this is this is this is uh, Nick Timoreus quoting Kashkari on investors' expectations of rate cuts. Quote: I've spent enough time around Wall Street to know that they are culturally, institutionally optimistic. He asks, "Is it a game of chicken?" And Kashkari laughs. They are going to lose the game of chicken. Oh, that's the one that you sent me. Okay, game of chicken. Yep, yep, yep. Man, uh, Kashkari so, so does not hold back. What's with this tough rhetoric? Chill out, dude. <laughs> Why? So that that's from a 7,600-word New York Times magazine story that tells the tale of what the Fed has been doing over the last year or two, partly through a profile of Kashkari. I think we're all set with this guy. <laughs> what, is 7,600 words enough? <laughs> is, there, is there more that we need to read or hear from him? Uh, he seems to be the guy that reacts really aggressively in both directions. Mm-hmm. He was a zero percent interest rate guy for a long time, and the Fed's not doing enough. And now it's the other way. Let's play a game of chicken yeah. and see if Wall Street wants to guess how high we're willing to take rates. I think he's the Fed's influencer, besides <laughs> Jay Powell. He's like their TikTok so. account. He's basically. their SBF. <laughs> uh, I don't, I don't, you know what? I don't really care that much about what he has to say. I'll follow the two year. I'll take your, I'll take your advice on that. Yeah. Well, so the thing with the two year too is I think. I mean, I think the trend is obvious here. The the Fed is peaking out hopefully soon if we get inflation under control. And then after that, 
you know, hopefully we can bring rates back down. But I think the timing is where people are getting thrown off a little bit because they see the two-year fall and they're like, rate cuts are coming. And historically, especially in recent history, that hasn't happened because the Fed pauses. So what if, so what if the Fed doesn't cut? Then what? I mean, if the Fed doesn't cut, then rates stay high and we're all, we're all still stuck in this kind of purgatory of, you know. No main- landing? I mean, I have no idea. <laughs> Hopefully a soft landing. I think the Fed can pull it off, but- um, But don't we think it's a good thing if the, if the economy can digest higher rates, normal rates? Like, it's not like rates are double digits, just normal rates. The 10 year is, what are the 10 year fall to? The 10 year is three, four. It's not, ex- but wow, that's actually quite low compared to where it was. It was a yeah. four, four, wow. It broke three, five today. Wow, mm-hmm. um, but that's not high. If we can't take this, like- Jamie Dimon said the Federal Reserve's Rate hikes might need to go uh, 50-50 chance. They might have to go to 6%. He said on Fox Business last week. What do you think about that? <laughs> he wishes it would go to 6%. Well, uh, he would do pretty, they would do pretty well at, <laughs> at 6%. Yeah. Uh, you guys would too, by the way. Uh, yeah, yeah. We're a brokerage. Everybody would be okay with that, <laughs> except for the actual economy. But every, every, everyone running a platform that sweeps cash into some sort of a – Cash management vehicle would be okay with 6%. Look, I stay in the economy. I stay in a strong job market. Okay. Um, uh, Paul Tudor Jones said that if they pull this off, it would be a moon landing. We landed on the moon! <laughs> yeah, yeah, quote, there's huge amount of savings that consumers have from all the COVID relief bills and the stimulus that was applied both from a fiscal and monetary standpoint, said Jones. He is faced, talking about uh, Powell, he is faced with that very difficult proposition of working that down without breaking things. And he is saying this is the most challenging economic environment in 40 years. Sounds like a 2022 quote. And yeah. if we pull this off, it's a it's a perfect moon landing. Is that overstated? Understated? I like the imagery. Of the of Jay Powell landing the, the well, rocket. The on idea the moon. that we can break inflation without causing recession seemed highly unlikely. And I Just think did. the chances are growing. I think the chances are growing. And the consumer, I mean, we know the consumer is the best storyline in the economy right now, and it continues to surprise us, which as the months go by and as as I see the consumer stay strong and the job market stay strong, it's easier to believe in that soft landing that felt impossible six months ago. So the only way the consumer stays strong, well, so if last year was all about inflation, which Mm -hmm. I think it was. And if we had to boil this down, this year down to it's all about what is the blank? Is it all about employment? Is it all about earnings? Okay, so I'm going to whip some data out of my pocket for this. So we do quarterly surveys with retail investors, not just on eToro's platform. Globally, no matter the platform, demographic, age, whatever, we ask them what they're worried about, what they're investing in, what they're doing with their money, uh, just basically like a, like a brain download from retail investors. So we did a run in December, and all of last year in our quarterly surveys, investors were like, inflation is the biggest risk, bar none. Like, this is what we're worried about. I'm even adjusting my portfolio for or to I'm deal sorry, with inflation. sorry, but they're just getting this stuff because they're hearing it in the media. Like, no. They're, I don't, they were actually worried about inflation. Yes, because the media is – I'm just saying retail investors in general. Josh, they, the media does not drive gas prices. No, no, no. But it starts somewhere. But they're seeing it in their real lives too. Yes. Retail investors also told us that they were cutting down on their investing because their bills are higher. Yeah. Okay. So that, Okay, that's true. I, yeah, I, I I think that there's more there. But anyway, so the cut in December that we did, we asked them, what's the number one risk in your mind for 2023? They said the state of the U.S. economy. So I think we are pivoting over to recession worries now. Which okay, is, now which we're not worried it's sense. too hot. Now we're worried how fast it's But I just, off. I can't. It's hard to get bearish with employment this strong. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, that can change, right? I'm not saying that the economy that that employment will remain where it is, but as long as people have jobs, they will continue to spend money. John, give me this Bank of America. And as long as they continue to spend money, like how do you Uh, get credit card chart? Yeah, you can't fight it. Don't fight the consumer. And the other way to get bearish is listen. If you just say we're still we're still normalizing the rates versus equity valuation story, that you can convince me of. Yeah. That we're not in a zero interest rate environment anymore and stocks are still too expensive. That I could, I, fine. I won't, Callie, fight, I, won't fight, I won't fight you on yeah, that. Yeah, show me Speak, something. Speaking, speaking to that. So this is coming from, uh, let me read it off here. This is coming from Bank of America, credit and debit card spending, everything. This is, this is like until this week. So this mm-hmm. is up to So what are we looking at? Restaurant spending per household uh, income group, year over year change, of the seven day, uh, airline spending per household, 
entertainment spending per household, lodging spending per household. And which direction they, is it going? They're all reaccelerating higher. Vertical. Vertical. Mm. Total card spending. Look at this one. Total card spending mm. per household. And cruise. Cruise. Could you imagine? How do they look? Yeah. Cruise yeah. spending. These are ver these are all now trending hey, guess back what? higher. Transportation inf inflation right there. Cruises look okay. So, but that's the risk of that reacceleration. Yes. That's why they yeah. need Kashkari yeah. out there being a Bond villain. Yeah, because yeah Royal Caribbean is ripping. Yeah, like well, these stocks look good. Cruise. Yeah, I'm saying. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm agreeing with you. The data is agreeing. <laughs> uh, that's the problem. Look There's at still wind. Look at this chart. Look at this. Look at wind resorts. Yeah. So, okay. So what they did was they knocked like $10 trillion off of everyone's portfolio and home price, give or take, right? Like the losses in the home market. Mine didn't, go, mine didn't go down 10 trillion quite. <laughs> in the aggregate, the losses of like home values, stock market value, bond market, let's say 10 trillion mm -hmm. for argument's sake. That sounds like a lot. It didn't really put that much of a dent in consumer spending Got a that data. you would have guessed. Got a data. I saw a data point today. 90% of cash uh, of refis last year were cash out. How really? crazy is that? Really? That's wild. Which makes sense. I did. Give me my money. <laughs> yeah, my well, home is, I need to book a cruise immediately. My <laughs> home is magically up 25%. Um, okay. Cash out refis yeah. to take cruises. Uh, or to remodel. Aren't you remodeling? I'm getting I, mud. Actually, mud my mudroom is happening as we speak. You got your building awesome. mudroom? Yeah. What's a mudroom? So this is so this is funny. I sent this to my wife because some, I'm only middle class, so we don't have things no. Like shut that. up. You have a, you have a big you have because you have a because you have a two car garage. I don't. Okay. So what is a mudroom? So it's like hooks to put raincoats on, and then take an Instagram picture. So listen, it's where you leave so, all your shoes. So, somebody tweeted. Somebody tweeted. No idea. No idea. This was even a thing. But apparently, rich people have mudrooms and drop zones. I don't know what drop zone is, where they put their stuff before they enter their house. Well, I wouldn't walk into my own house wearing shoes. It's disgusting. Well, I do. So. <laughs> You look like an I animal. Agree. When, Wait, you walk out of Penn Station? Hold on. You, I wear sneakers in my house. How many Fight public me. restrooms do you use in a given day in Manhattan? 17. And I, then I, you go home and walk into your f***ing house? I do. No, you don't. I do. No, you need a mudroom yesterday. So, so <laughs> That's why I, I, have, I have a, a little, I have a one-car garage. So when we, mm -hmm. we go upstate a lot, we have a cabin upstate. When we come home, we just dump everything out in the, uh, in the door. Out in the yard. Yeah, and it takes, it just takes <laughs> like a they're week. They're real aristocrats. <laughs> it takes that. a week. So anyway, so we're cutting our garage in half and we're making, that's like where you have that's shit. No, that's smart to do that. We have like a whole wall in the garage. In your garage. Cubbies for shoes. So when you go to your house, you could go into your garage. garage and you could get undressed or do whatever you have to do. I don't have that. That's mm. essentially a mudroom. That's a mudroom. Yeah. So I basically- Your garage is your mudroom. I use it as a mudroom, yeah. but it's not a mudroom. Exactly. Right. Uh, yeah, you can't walk in. You walk on your carpet with the shoes I don't have that carpet. you walk through the city. I don't have carpet. Only uh, downstairs that's, I wear sneakers. So maybe that's not as, as grungy. And we also, like, we like we like uh, do the Swifter. We do no, the, we yeah. do. We throw our shoes out and we just get new shoes the next day when we leave the house. I Well, I wear new shoes every day. You don't? You've met you've met Sprinkles. You know there's no there's no mud coming into my house. So when, <laughs> no, when you go to Josh's house, take your shoes off. Oh, dude, take your shoes yeah, off in the enough. driveway. If you come to my don't house. Even come no, to I, but I do take the shoes, shoes off, off, but take your shoes off. Yeah, I'm in that camp. Take your shoes off. Uh, we all should be. Okay, <laughs> investor positioning. Despite weak returns in December, investors increased equity and bond allocations heading into 2023. For me, that's just rebalancing, but maybe I'm wrong. What do you think? What do you think? We have the chart? Yeah, I think you're right. I think it's rebalancing. I think there was a lot of rebalancing going on at the end of the year. As I mean, there should have been after right, a year right. like last year. I, mean, I'm I with rebalanced you. my portfolio. But I also think we shouldn't understate the fact that, you know, I— so the biggest thing that I've realized working and studying retail investors is the fact that retail investors invest when they have cash. And you just showed that B of A chart of you know, consumer yeah, spending going parabolic. Yeah. You know, retail investors have a lot of money, and that's a good thing. Amer Americans have a lot of money. The job market is strong, and they're going to invest that money. There are, I mean, there are undercurrents. So that's not the that's not the only thing there. But I think that you know this continued retail investor optimism is because Americans are doing really well right now. But as wait, well. I don't see optimism. So this is from State Street. If you look at the cash allocation. Mm -hmm. Now we look at percentiles, okay? So a year ago, it was 28%. So investors had relatively little cash. What was 28%? Their, their cash allocations. The in, cash allocation. In their portfolios? Not, not that they had 28% of their, of their portfolio in cash. If you look at the historical amount that they had in cash, this was the 28th percentile. So they had a light cash position. Okay. okay. Let, let, when? One uh, year a ago? A year ago. Okay. And so it was still a bull market. Exactly. And was exactly. Money. Okay. Uh in November, that was in the, it was in the 94th percentile. 
So, okay. So, okay. People, so I take all that back. Yeah, no, I'm just kidding. No, no. But you also have to separate. There's, there's all sorts of investors. Yeah. Right? There's traders. There's buying holders and everything in between. But just from this survey alone, and this is – everybody was bearish. The cash positions of uh, uh, mm-hmm. fund managers was at all-time highs. Across the board, right. you saw bullish – uh, I'm sorry, you saw bearish sentiment. The takeaway here, the rolling three-month flow differences, equity minus fixed income So look at ETFs. this. Look at January 21. Yeah. Could not get enough stocks. Right. So we and, finished the yeah. year just above the five-year median in favor of bullish on stocks versus fixed income. Yeah. Which is amazing to me because 2022 was hell. Like- I, yeah. Yes, we have also noticed that investors are raising cash. Uh, quarterly surveys going back to that. They have said for two quarters now that they're raising cash. I'm raising cash to buy stocks. How do you like that? <laughs> hey, some of them are too. We <laughs> asked them demo- why they're raising but there's cash. A democra- there's a demographic story mm-hmm. too. The makeup, like whatever this survey, so whoever this survey is tracking, it's, it's, it's a, a, a much, uh, fine, but it's a much, just it's a much younger investor demographic. So, AAII? No. 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 Just generally, like uh-huh. the, the whole population yeah. of investors oh, 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 oh. now okay. skews a lot younger oh. mm-hmm. than it did even five well, years ago. Ne- what yeah. if they're raising cash for mudrooms? Next chart, John. <laughs> this is- I would say I would say that's a good idea. This is the AAII. Uh, this is the bullish and bearish spreads. And just rolling over. And, and, it, and they also show their State Street co- Investor Confidence Index plunged. For good mm-hmm. reason. Listen, it's not- it's not just the meme stocks. It wasn't just the Kathy Wood no. stocks. Like Apple looks looked terrible. Yeah. Amazon cut in half. I mean, all of them. All yeah, of them. Yeah, where should sentiment be? Yeah. This had the worst year for a 60-40 portfolio. Uh, I think the third worst year of all time. Don't, I don't should sentiment be? I'm not saying that sentiment is is too – Is I'm saying it's appropriately bearish. Yeah. Like it should be bearish. It's however, been bearish for a year yeah, now. And it, rightfully so. Yeah. But however, when you have positioning that bearish and you have – a whiff of positive news mm-hmm. and things are less bad than expected, yeah. that's how you set up for a powerful rally. That is exactly it. And this is why bearish positioning, it feels really awful. I mean, we all feel awful and that's why we're bearish, but it is low key one of the strongest market dynamics. I compare it to getting punched in the stomach, but knowing that the punch is coming. You mm. know, if you know that you're about to get punched, you tense your stomach, you're like, oh my God, it's happening. Then you get punched and you're like, that didn't hurt. Like, the okay, anticipation fine. is worse than the uh, the event. Exactly. exactly. All it's the like time. stubbing your toe. You put yeah. so you you were explaining the quarterly survey of ten thousand global investors, mm-hmm. um, why they they haven't cut the amount of money that they've invested this past year. What you want to go through some of these reasons? Yeah, yeah, okay. definitely. So I'll so it is a glo- uh, global survey of ten thousand be- investors. I look at the U.S. cut, but we do like a big global survey. So anyway. U.S. cut. So, yes. So, so, overall, I've been shocked by how resilient the U.S. retail investor has been. Yeah. Uh, throughout the year, like, a majority of them have said, I am investing the same amount of money as I did three months ago, or I'm increasing that. And Hell yeah. It's, fasc- hell yeah. it's fascinating, though, that they're doing that. Yeah, exactly. You wouldn't and have predicted it. I wouldn't have predicted it. Well, it goes back to the fact that retail investors invest when they have cash. But that's yeah. also a good point. Like, forget about the, the surveys. What are they actually doing? Well, I mean, we feel like shit. We're still buying. <laughs> well, here you have it. You said some are moving into bonds and safer sectors like defensives. Yeah, they're diversifying. But they're not selling out. That's exactly. The, that's the key. And they're not cutting down the money that they're investing. They're not saying like, "Oh, this doesn't feel good." Like maybe I'll invest fifty instead. Well, also, of if you look at like Baltrunas does this all the time. If you look at ETFs under ten basis points, the index funds, they're mm-hmm. not getting. They're not slowing down the flows. Right. At all. Right. Yeah. Um, you said you're still seeing lots of interest in crypto. Wait, wait, wait yeah. hold on. Before we pivot to crypto. We're not pivoting to crypto. Okay. There's no, there's no, this is a non, non-crypto <laughs> podcast today. I thought we talked about SBF. Yeah, that was enough. I'll, fl- I'll fling <laughs> myself out okay. the f- window if we do, do any more crypto. But they are still showing an interest in crypto. They is are. that because mm-hmm. you can now buy things for a half a penny? Is that, <laughs> is that that phenomenon? Like, holy crap, this thing was $18 a coin and now it's uh, four cents? Well, I think it's a demographic story. So this December cut of data we got, I was, of course, the first thing I ran to was the crypto questions. And basically what we asked them were, um, we asked allocations. So we asked like, were you invested in crypto? Do you plan, yes or no? Do you plan on investing in crypto in the next three months? Yes or no? Do you put investing in quotation marks when you write that? (laughs) No? I'll have to to run that one by Amy. All right. (laughs) Crypto looks good here. Watch your math. Michael's bullish again. Crypto broke. I am bullish again. Crypto is breaking out right now. Yeah, but 
the really surprising thing to me is that, well, A, this isn't so shocking, but younger investors especially held on to their crypto. What did, bald, what did bald investors do? What did bald investors do? That's a oh, cut that we don't look at. If you just start asking. If- N equals one right there. <laughs> what did bald investors do? Can we do this put to call ratio snark? I want you to give it yes! to us. Yes. Oh, I this want is you my to give thing. I want you to like give us the the unvarnished. Just go really go for it. Okay. Okay. We'll First of on. all, explain to people, John has the chart up. Explain to people what the CBOE equity puts call ratio is, and then tell us why you're snarking on it these days. Okay. So the options put to call ratio. By the way, options are not suitable for all investors. High compliance. Um I, seriously, though. You just, you just <laughs> winked, though, when you said that. <laughs> I did not so wink. I just want the listener to know that. <laughs> All right. So the put call ratio is essentially the volume of SIBO, SIBO traded uh, equity put options uh, divided by the volume of SIBO traded equity call options. It's a ratio. Uh, yeah, it's a ratio. Okay. It's a ratio. We're trying to find out how many bearish bets versus how many bullish bets. Right. That's the, the but, essence of it. But zoom out from that because this is volume. You don't know what those traders are doing. They could be buying. They could be selling. And we're talking options, too. We're talking puts and calls. So it gets you're really selling hard. puts. You're bullish. Exactly. So it doesn't, doesn't really have, tell but you. But doesn't have to be somebody on the other side of that? It could be a market maker. Mm. Oh, interesting. So, oh, yeah. okay. Okay. Yeah, and- Options, I mean, option strategies are so wide these days because there are so many products out there. Institutions use dif- options differently than retail uses options. And it just. I have an iron condor on right now. So. <laughs> That's my favorite. On what, Doge? Name trade. Yeah. That's my favorite uh, name trade. All right. So people, people are looking at this really big spike that I guess began in 2021. Uh, ish. But well, I'm not, looking at the really spike. big, just, big spike at the end just, of 2022. It's not, it's not going end, away. What's so going on? So what are people saying is going on with this, and what is your problem with it? Okay, so put call ratio, it spiked a lot in December, and it spiked on the same day every week. I want to say it was Wednesday or something. And I picked up on it a little, a little into December because it seemed to be something that caught fire on Twitter. It was like the put call ratio is really, really high. That's got to be bearish. People are buying puts. First of all, we've already determined that put call ratio is volume. It's a it's an indicator of emotion, not direction. Um, oh, and, I like that. I like. Look at you. Yeah. All right, go on. Copyright. Go on. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I got the title. Cop. Indicator yes. of emotion. Yeah. All right, go on. Uh, all right. So put call ratio was really really high. I dug into the contracts that were being traded on the day when the put call ratio spiked. Were they at Mar-a-Lago? Where did you <laughs> dig into them? Well, I don't know who was trading them. Okay. But the top traded contracts the day that the put call ratio spiked were deep in the money puts on tech stocks, huh. which seems really, really bizarre. It kind of hit me weird at first because you think deep in the money, like that's not hedging. Right. And like, why would you buy deep in the money? So Who's, that? Who's doing B- Buffett? It, so it's actually institutions. <laughs> so I, I wrote like a little Twitter thread on this because, of course, I can't get it out of my mind. I'm like, look, this is deep in the money puts. Like, we know the put Who call ratio. Who would be putting that trade on and why? Somebody's selling that strategy to somebody else. Well, exactly. On and, Wall Street. And I threw out there, I was like, maybe it's, I don't know, maybe it's put sales for income or something. It's Kashkari. But I, <laughs> Kashkari. No, but doesn't that happen on the street? Like, somebody creates a strategy and they start selling it to the buy side. And then hedge funds are like, yeah, we're doing this strategy. And then when they, when they're like, uh, when they're like, talking to other managers and then all of a sudden it becomes a thing. Yeah. So that's how this you can get is, a rash of that. This was an institutional trend becoming a I thing. I got a rash, man. And right. the only way you can really the only way you can really tell is getting color from people who know the traders, which is kind of kind of crappy. But I, I talked to a few people after I posted that, you know, just because I used to be an options reporter. I know people. And <laughs> I I talked to them and they were like, no, this is this is a trade that's going on on Wall Street where um, institutions are basically rolling their put positions okay. and collecting the income on them, but avoiding that early exercise and just continually rolling them on tech stocks. And and that creates the appearance, this spike in the chart. That's volume, yeah. Okay. So yeah. there's nothing really particularly directional about that. It's not bearish. It's actually neutral because you, you have to hold the stock. So were you the point. only person to go out there and explain that? Um, or were you the first person to like – Make yeah. It. Uh, I, you know what? I don't know. SIBO, and this is why I feel extra legit about that explanation. SIBO came out and posted a blog post about it. There you go. The the exchange did where they, all of this volume to you or did they reference no, you? No, 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 no. And I doubt I was the first person to come out with it. Okay. Um, but I'm sure a lot of people were talking about 
But the overwhelming narrative was, oh, my God, the put-call ratio is spiking. It's bearish. And it's like, no, people, context matters. You're saying it's the same thing happening with the VIX, lots of short-term options activity that isn't captured in the normal VIX. What do you mean by that? Okay, so the VIX is my other favorite thing to snark on. And by the way, like, again, used to be an options reporter, wrote about the VIX a lot. The VIX can tell you a lot of stuff, and it has acted the same you want to say something? No, I'm okay. sorry. I just I just pulled it up. I'm like, whoa. Wait, what happened? Look at the VIX. It's just it's, smushed. It's, uh, wow. vol, vol smash down vol to smash. 20 again. Vol wow. Smash. 19. Sorry, I, love Kelly. A good I vol cut, smash. Sorry to cut you off, Kelly. No, no, no. You're good. He, by the way, he does that to everyone. Don't feel bad. <laughs> Go ahead. Hey, I know how it goes. Okay, so the VIX. Um, the biggest complaint about the VIX this year is that it hasn't spiked up to 80 or 90, even though we've been in this vicious, painful bear market. Not even 40. Can we get the Not 40? even 40. I think the top was like 36. Or I don't so. get out of bed for a 35 VIX. <laughs> So I mean, I do, but yeah. okay, um, <laughs> okay. I'm here, but you're right. We didn't have that thing that everyone said we needed to flush the market out. Like, you want a real bottom? You need a VIX forty. You need a VIX fifty. Like this right. is but the thing you? that we kept. Hearing. No, you don't. I think investors are appropriately anxious, but they're expressing that anxiousness in different ways. Mm. And I think. I really get fired up about this because I feel like the easy argument is, oh, the VIX hasn't spiked. It means we have further further to go. Like, mm -hmm. there's no fear. And I'm like, no. The data we see around the VIX, first of all, is incredibly bearish. Like, sentiment is bearish. There's no way around it. So what's going on with the VIX? Why is the VIX an outlier? And, you know, I dug into it a little bit. Short-term options volume is a huge amount of, you know, daily options volume. Spot Gamma actually does really good work on this. Um, they, they run the amount of short-term options volume. Uh, per day. You know Duncan runs that handle? No, he doesn't. Duncan, <laughs> what? <laughs> you bet, that better not be you. Duncan's like, no, I don't. No, I don't. Um, anyway, so, yeah. So short-term options volume is a huge, huge chunk of daily options volume. It's Meaning what? 30 to 50% or so. This is what Spot Gamma says. So I don't, I, I don't have that data. data. But um, the, why this is so important is because the VIX is a measure of 30-day options prices. And short-term options prices, we have weeklies, we have dailies. Um, if you're trading weeklies, if you're trading dailies, I mean, that's, that's one to five days. It's one to seven days or so. And there's actually this less well-known VIX. It's called the short-term VIX. It's a measure of nine day prices. And that VIX has been going insane this year and spiking before CPI days, before jobs days. Like how is so, that quoted? Is that quoted the same way the regular VIX is? Does it have like a number but, attached to it? Yeah. Yeah. It has so a number it? attached to it. For, for argument's sake. Oh God. It was like 37 yesterday. Holy shit. And that's people trading weekly op uh, options? That's nine-day options. So it's people nine trading day. on either side of nine days because I think they average it out. Huh. Yeah. Okay. And actually, so some – I forgot his name. Somebody actually wrote a paper on this. Okay. Um, it came out like a few Probably Corey ago. Hofstein. I think it was Chris Seidel. Mm. Okay. Chris, I'm sorry uh, if I that said That would make sense. Wrong. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm sorry if I was I love Chris. No, I owe him an email. We've had, we've, had, that. we've had Chris on the show. He's great. Yeah, but – so short-term options are dominating options flow. And of course the VIX isn't picking it up. It's not that the VIX is broken. It's just measuring what Something it's else, built. Something else, 30-day. Right, exactly. Yeah. And more and more people are not using those 30-day options. So you said the options ecosystem has changed a lot over the past few years. Yeah. Quote, for the better. But that means you have to think about options indicators differently. So maybe we should just be following the short-term VIX. Or that should be added to the, the arsenal of people who are trying to determine what's really going on in the markets. I mean, I definitely give it an eye. I, I tweet about it quite a bit. You see, I mean, you see the short-term VIX pick up before jobs days, before Fed days, before CPI days, which makes a lot of sense intuitive, well, intuitively, but. Yeah, because that event falls within that nine-day horizon. But exactly. Kelly, yeah. I think you spoke about this. We had Nicola's talking about this. The other, the thing is though that all of these things where you, the market got crushed because you would and and therefore you would expect a VIX spike, it yeah. happened because it was a CPI day and everybody was positioned for it. Mm -hmm. So CPI coming in hotter than expected will not cause a VIX spike because it's not it's not out of left field. VIX spikes tend to happen with unexpected downside, not expected downside. Yeah, and that's another really good point. I think Nick Holas said it was like a Hitchcock horror. Right. It was like Hitchcock yes. horror versus. Some other scary like, filmmaker. Yeah, I can't yeah. remember. Jump. Wes Craven. Let's go with Wes Craven. Yeah, yeah. So none of this has been really surprising. That's a good point. This has been a systemic pullback going back to the interest rates and inflation argument. Um, and we've been bearish all year. We've been appropriately hedged all year. So right. you know, nothing is really scaring us. It's Everything is less bad than we think. We're going to do this job market thing because you have some good charts here. We're jumping around a little bit. But I think this stuff is really important right now because – 
This is where the rubber meets, my opinion, where the rubber meets the road for the Fed mm -hmm. is labor. Yeah. Everything else is an offshoot. The way people spend, the cost of shelter, blah, that whole wage price spiral thing, all of that is predicated on whether or not there's going to be slack in the labor force or not. And right now there isn't. And unfortunately for the Fed, I think millions of people stop working forever during the pandemic. They're not coming back. And we have effectively net negative immigration for five years, six years. Like a lot of things are working against the Fed. Mm -hmm. So that labor thing is going to be tough for a while. But show us, uh, let's go through, John, show us this chart, uh, the first job market chart. This is from, this is from Dietrich. This is showing, let's go through this. this is the annual gain or loss for jobs. Mm -hmm. And obviously we know what happened in 2020, but we had back-to-back -back incredible years. In 2022, we added four and a half million jobs. And the next that's chart- such a big, that's such a huge, that's mm -hmm. one year gain in jobs. Well, the, the, the next recovery chart- recovery has been- Awesome. The next chart from, from the journal is really just a sight to be seen. What we're looking at for those of you who are listening on a podcast are the jobly declines on a monthly basis and then just the stair step high. We got them all back. And just look at this for a second. So we had gotten back to pre-pandemic levels of employment in the middle of 22. Is that right? Do I have that right? You said middle? I'm yeah. sorry. You, we got half of them back? All of them. And now we're that in the sounds, bonus. That sounds about right. Yeah. And now we're in the bonus. Yes, and that's right. Right. And it it's does. Incredible. It, incredible. It does. So we nobody lost, could have predicted this. We lost twenty million jobs in two months, March mm -hmm. and April of twenty twenty, and then we got them all back. And it really didn't take as long as a lot of people thought it might. Yeah, which is something we should celebrate. We would not have done as much stimulus had we known. Had we known that by midway through twenty twenty two. We were going to get all of the jobs back and then some. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't have had the March 2021 stimulus package, I don't think. Mm -mm. The Biden one. And well, he, he would have done it anyway. Just, he would have done it yeah. anyway because he got elected on that. Okay. let's. Uh, what's this Carl Quintanilla so, so, tweet? So I don't – you know, this this chart is uh, – <laughs> I don't even know what's going on here. It looks like the chart is going backwards. But the tweet is – this is from Pantheon Macro. Wage growth is narrowing rapidly. Um this dynamic strongly suggests that wage growth can return to a pace consistent with the 2% inflation target without a material increase in the unemployment rate. I'm just telling you right now, if this happens, soft landing achieved. Mm -hmm. What? If they can wage, bring, wage, this is the best argument for a soft landing. If they right can here. bring inflation down. Right. Wage growth can come down without the economy, <laughs> w w yeah. uh, without, without having a recession. You break inflation. Right. You slow, wage growth comes all the way down. Unemployment doesn't pick up. That And that's uh, that's it. Mm -hmm. That's a soft landing. Uh, and and what is this chart showing, though? Do you know how to read this? Do I know how US to read this? U.S. wages Phillips curve? Forget about this. doesn't okay. matter. Just pay attention. Well, it's the Phillips curve. It's unemployment versus wages. Yeah. No, but it, it does it's look like it's trending forever. backward. All right, it doesn't matter. Uh, it's coming back. It's, all right, now, the other, the, other, uh, the other thing is, well, if you look at tech stocks, and I'm not just talking about TDoc and DocuSign, look at what Apple is saying. Like everyone is saying the same thing. And what they're saying is not painting a very rosy picture. So I also, on the one hand, I could look at Caterpillar and say, well, listen, you don't get a recession when industrial stocks ripping like this. Mm -hmm. um, but also Apple is the, Apple's the king. Apple is the stock that matters most. So when they're saying that things are slowing on their end, what do we make of this? So, well, first of all, this is tech, right? Tech has been one of the hardest hit sectors from all of these crosswinds that we've had to deal with. The international problems. China. China, yeah. The dollar. Current, yeah, the dollar. Supply exactly. chain. All international problems wasn't the best phrase, but that's like all encompassing that right there. I mean, high growth, it, their stock got hammered. Not as much as the more speculative stocks. Um, but it makes sense that Apple is a little more, you know, kind of feeling this. I guess is my point. And I think that there's something interesting going on with big tech right now where like in a high rate environment, you just don't value innovation as much because you're thinking about what's working now versus what's going to work down the road. And big tech is in this kind of pivot point where they're seeing their lunch kind of get eaten by, you know, more upstart competitors and they're trying to pivot and investors just aren't allowing it. Is this the perfect storm of just saturation? Just Apple just was going to slow eventually, and it happens to be coinciding at a time when growth is out of favor. Is that just too coincidental? It might be. Co it might be coincidental, and I, I don't know. I don't know how you would really gauge that, but I do think it's really interesting that 
big tech is kind of having this identity crisis because you're seeing it with other stocks too. You're seeing it with Microsoft and OpenAI or Chat GTP. I, I can't remember which one they. OpenAI is the parent company. OpenAI. Okay. Um, you're seeing it with Facebook and the metaverse. Um, you're seeing it with Apple and trying to get more into software and services. Uh, it's almost like, you know, we're 10 years into it. Big tech is like, okay, well, what's the next phase of our lives? But I don't think they AW look invincible anymore is the, AW same, is the point you're making. And AWS yeah. just uh, posted its slowest growth rate since it started, since 2014. We got Apple, we got Apple App Store data yesterday. On Tuesday, Apple said it paid $320 billion to developers, up from $260 billion as of last year. Um Developers get 70 to 85% of gross sales. So that's Apple paying out. If all developers paid Apple, paid a 30% cut to Apple, Apple's App Store grossed more than 85 billion in 2022. If Apple's commissions were all 15%, the App Store's estimated gross would come in lower around 70 billion. That's the same amount of sales Apple suggested with the same data point last year when the company said it paid developers 60 billion. So what they're saying is this represents a plateauing of activity on the Apple App Store, which arguably is like the largest technology platform or- No, it is. It's got to yeah, be, right? Yeah. yeah. And then also, they're, they're repli I think they're trying to replace Broadcom. They're like building that internally, that chip. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, they're pivoting to a, a different phase of their, but their then life. But pe then people are like, oh, Apple subscription business is slowing. <laughs> they, they just had another record year. They went from 745 million subscribers in 21 to 900 million subscriptions in 22. So, yeah. yeah, so it's slowing massive. relative to what? Well, I guess relative to yeah. relative to the fact that the market it's cap- It's a billion subscriptions. I guess relative to the market cap of $2 trillion and relative to the fact that all of this growth has already been priced into the stock. Yeah, and then there's, there's obviously other tech-specific industry dynamics that I don't understand. Like, I'm sure if you had somebody else on here to explain it, they would give you a much more, like, detailed explanation and really dig into all these tech trends going on. But that's the big thing to me, the innovator's dilemma in big tech. That's really, it's, it's. I mean, I'm an analyst. I look at the pros and cons of everything. But it, it's, like, interesting, but at the same time, it's worrying. There's holes it's in change. E There's holes in every one of these stories right now for the reasons that you laid out. Like, ev mm -hmm. for every one of the, the fan mag stocks, like there's a serious hole and it doesn't mean worst case scenario will definitely happen. Well, let but me ask you this. So, so the advertising slowdown, how much of that is consumer demand versus the fact that these companies were all funded with unlimited money and that's over now? Well, I think high rates definitely have something to do with it. Oh, for sure. And so yeah. I think that- That's the first I, thing you cut. So yeah. I, think that yeah. you, I think that you could make the case that tech is in a recession. I mean, of course it is. And that it will continue and it doesn't necessarily- tell you about the economy what you think it might. Exactly, right. Which Tech is, which is, is not the economy. You have, which, yeah. you have right now rolling recessions that are sector stories. You have recession in uh, office property. You have recession in residential real estate. You have recession in tech media telecom. You have recession in crypto, LOL. Uh, these are real. The people working in these industries, they don't give a shit what GDP says. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They are living in recessionary conditions, mm -hmm. period, right now. I was at I was at Islander game uh, two nights ago with two of, two of my friends, and one of them is advertising, and the other one does real estate law, and it's a recession. Mm -hmm. Like that's it. Period. Like uh, the, for 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 an economy like ours that's this dynamic and this uh, this much dispersion throughout the economy, we should just not be focused on is the whole economy in recession yet. Let's be realistic. If you do certain things or live in certain regions of the country, you could absolutely have different economic situation than someone else you know who's from elsewhere. Yeah, so. and it's a blessing and a curse. Like, obviously, you don't want to see certain sectors pull back. You don't want to – I mean, you want people to thrive. Yeah. I mean, end game. That's I where we start. Uh, okay, maybe you don't. No, I'm just <laughs> No, I'm with you on that. So, so this is fun. Bed and Bath was up 50% today. Carvana was up 46%. Are we going to get a – are we going to get another meme, meme explosion? No, because those won't revisit the old highs. Okay, unpopular opinion. I'm just opinion. saying. I'm just saying that was today. That was a 50% move in, in, what did I say, Bed and Bath and a 46% move in Carvana today. I'm only buying the debt of those companies. What did GameStop do today? Unpopular GameStop opinion. was up uh, 9%. I am, Go ahead. I am not a meme stock investor, but I think the concept of meme stocks is not dead. 
the concept of investing with community, the concept of, you know, watching, I, if it, if it boils down to it, it's basically investors watching each other and thinking, is Hey, there a silver lining? Is there a, even though everyone lost all the money that they made in, in the big three or the big five meme stocks, is there like a, a positive takeaway from that experience? Yeah. People were investing. Maybe they got burned, but they were investing. They were even though they were buying things for the wrong reasons, and or with, the friends they made along the way. It was the friends <laughs> they made along. The way. Well, how about no, this? It's I try to think like about the silver lining of that. Is yeah. all right. Their first experience wasn't great, but they're probably not going to do it again. But then you're saying like they will. It's not black. Maybe they will. This is not black or white. Yeah. Right. Like there's there's some good in it, some bad in it. I see I see both sides, and I don't think that like I don't think it's like a cop out. I really do. Yeah, and we're still seeing really high retail investor engagement. So I have reason to think that, yeah, there was a silver lining there. Did they all become short sellers last year? All, <laughs> did all the meme stock babies of 2021 become like um, little mini uh, short sellers in 22? Do you see like any any activity like that? Uh, you know, we don't ask about shorting. Um, no, they bought the inverse arc though, right? Didn't that thing raise a ton of money? S-Arc? Oh, uh, are you thinking yeah. like TQQ? No, well, S-Arc, that's not, S-Arc. Oh, S-Arc? Well, TQQQ was a highly traded, uh, yeah, yeah. highly traded vehicle. On our so platform. for that yeah. younger crowd, they're like, "Oh, this doesn't work anymore. That works now. I'll do that." I guess that's kind of like what most people do when they come into the market in their first few years. Yeah, but I, I also think that's kind of over generalizing it of because course. a most lot of retail investors that. are long term investors. They're yeah, like, yeah. "Look, I just want to like make a nice nest egg and go away." Can we talk about time frames? Let's so, talk about time frames. All right, so. Um, you talked about how the short-term outlook is challenging, but the long-term outlook is bright. Tell us why you feel that way. I, I agree with you generally, but I, I'd love to just hear your take on, on this stuff. Yeah, so this is the really fun part about being a retail investor strategist. Um, there are many, many fun parts, but 2022 was awful, but the silver lining was, you know, the Fed is getting inflation down and nothing lasts forever. That sounds very, very heady, yeah. but- no, all things must pass. Exactly. And, yeah. and the biggest thing that I tried to get our customers to realize is if you're a long-term investor, this is an opportunity right here. And everything around you is so bearish because the short-term outlook is that challenging. I mean, it was, it's funny, like, looking at sentiment and indicators for Wall Street versus retail. I guess they were both bearish, but it seems like there were so many talking heads stepping out there and saying, like, this is the worst. Things are ending. I mean, you mentioned Jamie Dimon. And then it's like, no, if you're a long-term investor, the world is changing underneath your feet. Those are new trends. I mean, society is resilient. Humans can get through this. I know it's painful right now, but nothing lasts forever. Sure. And I mean, the best thing is the Fed is trying to get inflation down. And that is an incredibly bullish storyline if you want to look at long-term trends, because they're basically saying we want, well, A, we want to you know get inflation under, under control, but we also want to flip this lever eventually back from you know conservatism or where we are back to innovation. So if you have the patience, if you have the risk tolerance to wait this out and invest like you normally do, then, you know, you can make it to the other side and things will be better. So you're citing clean energy, deglobalization, robotics, AI, and then millennials coming into their economic power as uh, four of the biggest, not, there's not really catalysts. These are just like bigger secular trends. Like themes. Yeah. This is how the world is changing. I mean, millennials coming into their earnings peak like is well how is, is the, super old, the oldest millennial now is like 42 or 44 depending yeah, on what your right. starting date is yeah so yeah the world is now theirs um my my crew is going to pack it up and shuffle off <laughs> this mortal coil soon enough i mean yeah but we own the world now that's good though it's 73 million of you and uh you guys are super uptight about a lot of things <laughs> but overall probably the most capable generation we've ever seen in a lot of respects and I think ambitious. And there's like a lot of positive qualities about the new you know, workforce. I don't like millennials being spoken about. Show. I've been bald. For, I've, been bald I've been bald for 15 they're years. Not, no, they're not children. <laughs> but they're, no, but there are things about the millennial demographic that I think lead to a very positive setup for America. Very positive. Yeah, definitely. And we're all, in, not all of us, but many of us are in our prime household formation years, which I think is a really good storyline for A, the you know housing the, market. You know what the biggest difference between millennials and boomers? Because I'm in the middle. I'm like a, the last- Gen X? I'm the last Gen X. Okay. I'm like the last year of Gen X. Um, I identify more with millennials, obviously. Even like the older Gen X people, I these are people that like drop Caddyshack references. I don't know what the hell they're talking about. <laughs> I'm more like a millennial. I'm actually more like a, a Gen Z these days. Because no, it's just like talking heads. 
Yeah, they're think, right. Yeah. No, Barry, Barry is loves true Tony. <laughs> Barry loves Tony. Barry Hicks. loves anything like Steely Dead. CBGB's was like what a big cultural that? touch point for his generation. It's like the club in downtown Manhattan where like the Ramones and television used to play and Blondie. It was like new wave and punk. And then like they, the, his generation thinks like Stripes mm-hmm. is the oh, height of comedy. Phil Collins, Stripes is not good. <laughs> no, none of it's good. So All here's right. the question. What do you think Wait, about 2000s? We were talking about demographics. Oh, millennials. Uh, oh, so the millennials. big difference, my experience between millennials and boomers. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I teach this to advisors, actually, who are trying to – most advisors like 10 years ago, all their clients are boomers. Mm-hmm. And now they have to talk to their own generation and it's like they don't know how. Yeah. Um, the big difference is boomers, you could like say something and if you were like really persuasive enough in the way you said it, they would just believe you. Like <laughs> – you could walk like you could walk up to like three guys in a bar and just be like, Babe Ruth had a third nipple. <laughs> and they'd be like, No, he didn't. No, he did. <laughs> no, he did. Of course he did. Uh, he absolutely did. <laughs> they'd be like, Oh, all right. Right? Uh-huh. If you if you do that shit with millennials, they will look it up in front of you. They yep. will they will pull their phone out and fact check you in the moment. Over anything. We have no shame. We're you like, could say, show me the receipts. You could say, like, you could literally say, oh, I got drenched. It's raining out there. And a millennial will whip their phone out and be like, it wasn't raining. And they will, <laughs> like, they will do that shit. The implications for Wall Street and for people in our profession is you can't, you have to know what you're saying to people. Mm-hmm. And if you're making a claim, you have to have evidence like if you say to somebody, this is a great time to buy international value stocks, which I think we're all, we were all talking about that before. Mm-hmm. Why? Like for, I think for a boomer audience, like, oh, okay. <laughs> it's not like that anymore. And yeah. that to me, generationally, I could see where you might think that's a pain in the ass. Talk to people that fact check you in real time. But I think it makes you better at what you do, especially working on Wall Street and trying to deal with millennial investors. Yeah, let me ask you this. So we all know millennials and younger investors. The thing investors with Babe are- Ruth, not true, <laughs> by the way. I don't want to put that out there. Oh, I was supposed to whip out my phone and look it <laughs> yeah, up. Yeah, Man. Um, <laughs> what would but- happen if you Googled that? Possibly true. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't. I don't know. I'm not just giving you like an outlandish thing that you, he could, might have. you could convince people of. Yeah, no, he might have. Yeah. Go on, I think Callie. it's yeah. Magic School Bus and Reading Rainbow that made us I so love Magic yeah, School so, Bus. Yeah. What was her name? What is Oh, uh, Miss Friz- Frizzle? Miss Frizzle? 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 Oh, she yeah. was great. Wait, Reading Rainbow was my generation. Well, still no, we're the Magic School. We were still watching. Magic School. That's for the yeah. guy from Star Trek. And SpongeBob. Next SpongeBob generation, right? Movie. I was too old for SpongeBob. Oh, okay. Okay. What were you saying? Okay, so financial, something I've thought How about How big of a was, tangent did I just take the show on? I'm sorry. <laughs> I have no idea. Where, okay. Oh, we started talking about millennials. Yeah, you, so you guys are like awesome millennials, the, the two of you. So oh, I, would, I would just you. say that. Duncan's an okay millennial. Um, okay, so my question about financial advising when it comes to millennials and younger investors, I feel like you're going to have a lot of clients roll in with some like really alternative investments. I mean, maybe they held on to their meme stocks. Maybe they have crypto. You know, maybe maybe there's like some endowment effect going on where it's like, okay, well, I really like the stock because I like the product. I'm wondering how financial advisors, how well equipped they are to deal with Younger investors coming in and basically saying, "Well, I have this." What do you think? Like, are we? Saying, I, I don't. I don't think. I don't, I, I don't think. I don't think a lot of those no? people need financial advisors. Okay. Um, I think you need financial advice when the either complexity gets to be that you need outside help, like you have legitimate questions, and or it's an amount of money that you're not comfortable managing. And I feel like for most people that are under thirty, they don't necessarily need that. People, but do you think they'll get there? That's oh, the I, oh, I know oh, they yeah. will. Of course, I'm positive. So Everyone what if they there. get there and they're like, "Well, I have, I have." They're, my gonna, they're, not, they're not going to. Well, they're right. going to grow That's it. when we teach them about tax loss uh, uh, write offs. Listen, <laughs> when when you when when you look for a financial advisor, it's not because your birthday came up and and you're forty, and it's like, "Oh, I'm forty. I need an advisor." It's always a life catalyst. Mm-hmm. I'm starting a family. Inheritance. My dad died and left me money. I'm making a career change. I got fired. I got hired. I'm selling a business. Like mm-hmm. it's always so, so that could happen to people at 20, at 30, at 40. So to Mike's point, it's it's complexity and a, a sense of higher responsibility, usually because mm-hmm. the dollar amount has gone up. Yeah. That's the thing that drives somebody saying, I need financial advice. So for 
that won't apply. Unfortunately, that won't apply to everyone in every generation. Yeah. It's always going to be a subset of people that really need help. But, but how about this? To the bigger point about what do you do with people that want to do what you're talking about? We'll do it. There's nothing wrong with, with eating your vegetables and also drinking a milkshake. Like you can do yeah. both things. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. And I do that. I just, I wonder if advisors are, and you say that it's not going to be a big issue and I totally believe you there, but like, I mean, millennials and younger investors, they just feel like a different breed. Mm. Are now, every, for every, gener- they every generation. They do every now. Generation they is. do now. They'll like, grow up. You know what happens? <laughs> no, you no, know what mean, happens? I don't mean that condescendingly. I mean, they will get older. Right, right, right. You, they, get, yeah. you get engaged. You get married. You don't have time need, for this nonsense. You need somewhere to live. Once you need somewhere to live, that means you have to take out debt. Once you take out debt, the pressure of, of your career amplifies. It crowds out a lot of the other bullshit that made you feel special and unique. Then you have kids. Mm-hmm. It, it gets even harder. And all these things are good things, by the way. It gets even harder. You're not like you don't have time you to mean focus even better, on even better meme stocks. Life even gets better. better. Life, Life gets, gets better. even better, yeah. but, but uh, they tell me. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> but you 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 don't have the time for frivolity with your finances, mm-hmm. and so every generation turns into their parents. Yeah. It's only a matter of time. And I've said get, this before. I'm eating. I'm eating cottage cheese with pineapples in it. I mean, I am my dad. I started eating yeah. cottage cheese for breakfast too. Yeah, there oh, we go. No. I mean, you're you're an old. Welcome. Oh, no. Welcome. I put Where's cottage cheese on my McGriddle. Every morning, that's my that's my go to. Um, did you have fun today? I had so much fun. Okay, oh Kelly, this is great. Kelly, so we're so happy that you you'll came. come back. Yes, I'll come back. Okay, yes, you know dozens absolutely. of people are going to listen to this, right? I know, I know. Okay, I mean, I'm going to send it to all my friends. All right, so. We could have got for, we could have got for another hour. Yeah, for this sure. is a lot we didn't get to. For sure. Um, we're so happy to have you. So we do this thing to end every show, which I'm sure you know, called favorites, mm-hmm. and you're going to go first. Yeah. And what do you think uh, the Compound and Friends listeners and viewers should be paying attention to, reading, watching? What do you got? Hit us. Okay, so reading, I've got a really good one. Um, and shout out Lule Demise. She told me to read this book, The Seven Habits of Highly Successful People. Amazing book. And That's I know, been around for a while, right? I know it's yeah. one of the I best. I haven't read it. No, for a reason. Very good, for a very good. It talks so about- Stephen Covey? I, oh, it up. I think it is Stephen okay. Covey. Yeah. Why do you like it? So I'm only I'm only one of the seven habits in. I'll be I'll be honest, but it's all about how to be an effective person. How Procrastination to be an effective number one. Which, which habit are you up to? Cottage cheese. Perception. <laughs> okay. Cottage cheese was cottage cheese was the intro. <laughs> okay. Right, it was it. like eat cottage cheese. All right, all right. Let's get into the real stuff. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I'm in I'm in more of the perception and understanding that people have different perceptions and you know if somebody is acting the way they are, it's probably something going on with them. That's a really crude way of explaining it. I should probably read more, but. It's, it's all around perceptions and understanding why people make the decisions they do. Um, and I really like heady books. I'm weird like that. I, I do heady stuff at my job and then get off and you know, read heady stuff. Um, but Seven Habits of Highly Successful People, really, really good. Uh, I don't have really good streaming recommendations. I mean, I'm watching the Harry it's and Meghan. slow right now. It's slow right now. It's a little yeah. slow, yeah. yeah. Everybody says White you Lotus You can't get is enough good. of this Harry and Meghan thing. I love Tell me why. the monarchy, man. I have, I, no, I have no opinion because I'm not paying any attention to it. What what is it that's attracting your attention to this thing? I think it's something about how society has accepted this thing. And I'm talking about the monarchy here. Um, but you can apply this to a bunch of different things. Society has accepted this one thing, and it turns out that it was all just— it was all Ma- just Made up. Well, made up, but it had, like, chinks all over the armor, basically. Society seems to be rebelling against this at an accelerating rate. Like the monarchy uh-huh. has been falling apart slowly for a thousand years I thought they since loved the, the Magna Carta. I thought they loved basically. the royal family. But no, but I, I feel like a deal with Spotify for a podcast and a Netflix show have accelerated something that like the English Enlightenment, mm-hmm. um, like like it, it took hundreds of years and then like six months. Yeah. That's to me, like from the outside looking in, that's how quickly it feels as though this whole – monarchy concept is like crumbling. Like it, it feels like it's happening really fast. Exactly. And that's happening all like around Meghan society Markle too. brought down the British royal family. Yeah, she effectively. did. Effectively. Yeah. And you're down with that shit. All right. I'm uh, down. I Listen. mean, I didn't say I was down with it. I I'm just like watching it. it happen. No, but you gave, me, <laughs> you gave me a little bit of, damn right she is. All right. <laughs> all right. All I right. don't hate it. All right. What else? I mean, UNC basketball, go heels. I had to do a good, I had did to you throw go to out U- the Did you go to UNC? Is that, is that a, 
like trick question? No. Oh my um, god, yeah. The, the, the listeners don't know. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I went to UNC. Uh, I grew up in North Carolina. Yeah. Huge, huge Tar Heel fan. Duncan you, Duncan's you, from North Carolina. You should mention Duncan. that. Hey, you're from North Carolina. Do you know Duncan? <laughs> <laughs> you should talk a little bit about the UNC team that's uh, just off a 13 win streak. UNC Wilmington, my alma mater. Just oh, so. no kidding. Yeah, nobody wants to hear that shit. Well, so right. UNC Wilmington's coach, well, up until a few years ago, was actually one of our assistant coaches, and the name escapes me, but yeah, we UNC system. There you go. Right. I visited uh, Chapel Hill once. What yeah. a beautiful place. Yeah, oh my gosh. It's just, it has my heart, but I'm biased. I grew up in North Carolina, watching a lot of UNC basketball. We were number one preseason, not so great now, but that tends to be our, our projection every year. Um, and... The Tim Ferriss, Mark Manson podcast. Who's Mark episode. Manson? Mark Manson is the author of uh, The Subtle Art of Giving, Not Giving a... Uh-uh. Never read that. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Have, I haven't read it either, but... And I listen to Tim Ferriss from time to time, but I listened to this episode a week ago, and it's all about just basically how Mark Manson became a blogger, and he just delves into, like, his creative process a lot, like, how he, how he started writing the book, and I just love breaking the fourth wall and hearing how other you know, more creative, writer-minded people do it because that's that's who I am. I went to J school. I would consider myself a sensitive writer when it comes down to it. I'm a numbers person, but that's truly who I am. So hearing hearing somebody else's perspective on how to be creative, how to write, uh, is just really, I don't know, it's just really interesting to me. I'll definitely check that out because I'm, I'm, inter- I'm interested in the same thing. So What's, yeah. what's J that's school? Good. Journalism school. Journalism school. Good question. Oh, who was the journalism professor at uh, UNC? Chris. Uh, Chris Rausch. So I Chris visited Rausch his class. Chris Rausch is the reason why I'm here. Uh, were you there when I visited? You're, no, you're older I don't than think that. So. Wait, how is it the reason that. that you're here? We invite. Well, I invited you, not Chris Rausch. Well, okay, that's true. Chris Thank Rausch you. inspired you to uh, look at finance. Chris Rausch is the reason why I took a business journalism class. Okay, and Very I started cool. off as a reporter, and then I turned into an analyst. Wow, wouldn't have go. happened without you. You know him. who else? Julia Laroche. Uh, yeah, yeah. A uh, whole bunch of people that I know came out of Chris's class. Yeah, and he had talking biz. Talking Biz News. Ta- talking Biz News, where he chronicled which financial journalists were going, like, from CNBC to Wall Street Journal. Like, he did that for a long time. Yeah, it's like you switch jobs and, like, Chris has already written about it. You're like, I haven't even announced it. How'd you do? So, yeah, so yeah. Chris invited me down to lecture his uh, J-School class mm-hmm. on how the stock market gets covered and yeah. blogging, which is something that I was uniquely – it was probably 10 years ago. Um, but I, I, re- I remember that. It was kind of cool. Yeah, so shout yeah. out to Chris. Is Chris like, you think he's listening to this? Is he still? I'll tell him to listen to it. He's him. at Quinnipiac now, actually. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Okay. He's tell the him, dean of Tell him to listen to this episode. Uh, Michael, you have a favorite for us this week? Uh, yeah, I got a few. Okay, go. I was rewatching Hall Pass. It was on HBO. I don't know. What is that? Really? Yeah. Owen Wilson, Jason Sudeikis. I don't think I saw it. I know what it is. I don't think I saw it. It's very funny. Okay. All right. Um, what else? What did I see this week? Oh, I went, I saw a... Uh, I saw a horror movie in the movie theater called Megan. You know about this? I was going to go. Oh, is it? Was it good? It was Me- incredible. It was really? so much fun. No, it's a doll. It's like another Chucky. It's it's oh. so it's so much fun. It's like it's way I mean I, I like Chucky, but this is this is way better. Were people in the theater like jumping out of seats? It was it was me and four tweens. That's it. The whole theater. That, that's it. Um it was scary. Did you sit it was right next to them. Yeah. It was funny. Theater? Allison Williams was great. It was all, it was just mm-hmm. and it was 90 minutes. I was I was home before Robert even knew I was gone. Oh my gosh, I have such a rant about how long movies have become. I'm like, if you can't do it in 90 minutes, why? Make it two. So Babylon's yeah. like three okay, hours, hours plus. Sure. I want to see if I'm not No, make it two that. movies. Yeah. Like, like why, why, oh, why is there need to be? So saying. here's the great thing yeah. about movies these days. Uh, Megan will be on, you can watch it at home in, in 30 days. Right. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. The minute it leaves the theater, which it does after a week because everything's a flop. So I, I saw I, I saw somebody tweet about it or something and I thought it was kind of a joke. And then I looked, went up on Tomatoes and it got like great reviews from the critics. I was like, oh, wait a minute. Well, did you like Annabelle? Uh, I love all those movies. The Conjuring movies. I love, I love I, all same. of them. Love. Okay. So this is, this is like not like that, but sure, same thing, I guess. Um, that movie Babylon flopped. Uh, Babylon flopped. I still want to mm-hmm. see it, but I'm not doing it in the theater. No way. Who's in that? Uh, Brad Pitt, Margot Robbie. Ed Norton. Ed all. Right? Is Edward Norton in that? I think I think it's I'm a really huge disappointed. Cast Speaking of, I'm and nobody ve- went. I was very disappointed with Glass Onion. Like, sure, I had fun, whatever. It was just such a disappointment. I, had such yeah. a hope. I, had such a, I missed. I it. haven't seen it, but I did okay. recently watch the first movie that's escaping my mind. It's um, what's the name? The of first it? Knives Out. Knives Out. Knives Out. Yes. That's how right. much, yeah. Holly, that was that was awesome. Uh, yeah, I thought awesome. it was really good. Yeah. But it's hard. 
mean, sequels are never as good as the original, yeah. right? Yeah. So just, I'm a little I worried thought about thought watching Glass Onion for that. I thought reason. this was different. It just it wasn't it wasn't very good. No. You listen to music? Do I listen to music? Yes. Yeah. Talking <laughs> Talking Heads. Uh, I like the Talking Heads. I went through a Talking Heads phase during COVID. Okay. Mm-hmm. You ever listen to? You ever see on the Apple Music app they're like putting out things in spatial audio now? No, because I use Spotify. Mean? I don't know what it means. Can you explain it, Duncan? What is spatial audio? I, I actually don't know that much about it, but it's kind of, it's surround sound. It's supposed to be immersive. It's and, immersive. And like your headphones? No. Yeah. Like you have AirPods in, right? Yeah. And the music is coming to you from one direction. I love it. If you turn your head, it like is still coming to you from that same direction as though you're in the room. Does that make sense? How could you be oh, bearish? Wow. How could yeah, you be no, bearish? It's, it's kind of like using Technology. the accelerometer in the in the Right. AirPods. So it may, so you're moving around physically with the AirPods in your ear. But it's making it as though you're in the space that the music is being played. Anyway. I love that. So I started clicking on, they're like putting out old music Mm -hmm. remastered in this, or maybe not remastered, but reformatted in this spatial audio. Yeah. And I can't believe how cool, and I don't listen on AirPods. Like I have like real headphones. I'm like an audiophile. Um, They just, like last week I saw the concert for George Harrison. They put it out. This was, George Harrison died in like 2002. Mm Mm-hmm. They put filled Royal Albert Hall with all his friends, and everyone came out and played his songs, like clapped in and just everybody. Yeah. So they put that out in spatial audio, and you put it on your ears, or you're driving and it's in your car, and you just like really feel like you're in at this event. Yeah. So my recommendation this week, find something, live event or otherwise, on Apple's uh, music site in spatial audio. And is spatial audio its own category? No, but they'll just like say new in spatial uh, audio. Like where it would say Dolby or something. Uh, say spatial. Yeah. So, right. So they're like just dropping, they're just dropping old stuff that you probably either never saw or whatever, but in the new format. And it, I, maybe I'm tricking myself into thinking that I notice, but I feel like it's really very, better. It's very cool. You I know what I'm, you, yeah. you've checked it out. What's your favorite George song? I just dropped a reference to all things must pass while we were recording the show. Yeah, maybe accidentally, maybe not. Uh, Here Comes the Sun? He wrote that, right? Yeah. yeah. No, I think that the album, All Things Must Pass, start to finish, is like on a par with any Beatles album, like truthfully. It's like maybe not as well known, but I think like if you say what's his best work. Did he do One My Guitar Gently Weeps? Yep. Yeah, and Clapton played Tax on that. Yeah. Uh, Revolver's th- the best. That's a good one. Uh, yeah. I like What Is Life. Well, listen, check this concert for George. Again, it was taped in 2002, but Ringo's on it. Paul McCartney Wait. comes out on stage. Monty Python comes out. and Wait, Monty Python's a person? No, it's a comedy troupe. But oh. they were friends with George Harrison. Oh, okay. So all of his friends come out and play tri- pay tribute to him, and now it's in spatial audio. It's worth listening. All right, we're going to wrap up. This was Callie, so much fun, Callie. Amazing. Thank you. Oh, my gosh. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you for having me. Mutual admiration society <laughs> over right. here. It was so much fun. And uh, we're going to have you come back next week. Are you busy? <laughs> <laughs> I'll fly back up. Sure. All right. Everybody follow Callie. Where do we follow your stuff? Tell tell the audience where they can read more of you. I know you're a tweeter. I am What's a tweeter. What's your Twitter handle? Callie A. Bost, B-O-S-T. Follow me on Twitter. I post on LinkedIn. Uh, thanks, Elon. All right. Uh, <laughs> and IG, hopefully one day. And shout and out eToro. Shout out eToro. eToro has a blog. If people become a client, can they just start sending you emails? <laughs> if, <laughs> if you want, if you right. want. It's probably easier to get me on Twitter. But Callie, you are a treasure. Thank you so oh, much for coming you. on. We had the best time. We would love to have you back someday. I'm and uh, All right, awesome. You did a great job. Duncan, great job this week. John knocked it out of the park. Shout out Nicole. Shout out Compound Nation. We will be back with an all-new episode next week. Have a great weekend.